good vibes all around in the room. So let's, uh, so stick around after, and we'll like you know keep that keep that party going. But you know, reading probably. <laughs> um, and then I'm just waiting for the cue for the crowd cast. Oh. All right. Um, hello and welcome. Thank you all for being here and for joining us out there on Crowdcast. Um, really thrilled to be uh, welcoming Carlos Cumpion and uh, Angie Trudel Vasquez uh, for a reading this afternoon. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, uh, my name is Mike Wen. I'm the program director at Woodland Pattern. I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement and say that here in Milwaukee, we live and work on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, part of North America's largest system of freshwater lakes where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinick rivers meet and the people of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. We further acknowledge the grave evil colonialism introduced to these lands through genocide as well as slavery, but also via racist and xenophobic beliefs, laws, and practices that continue to inflict harm upon black, brown, and indigenous lives. We honor those who have lived and do live now at these intersections of identity and experience and are committed to the active dismantling of white supremacy. Um, so thank you, Carlos, and thank you, Angie, um, for being here. Um, and and uh, yeah, thrilled for this opportunity to host you both. Uh, I also have to say thank you, Brenda Cardenas, for um, organizing this and for just generally being such an enthusiastic uh, uh, collaborator and friend to Woodland Pattern um, all the time. Uh, and it's wonderful, so thank you. Um, Brenda will introduce both of the poets. Um, uh, but before that, I do want to mention there are books for sale, um, uh, including the most recent publications uh, by Angie and Carlos, which respectively are My People Redux and Human Cicada. Um, I also hope that you will join us for some upcoming programs, both here and uh, offsite at Myad, in, uh, it, in, uh, to coincide with uh, the exhibition there, retrospective exhibition, uh, then as now, Woodland Pattern 1980 to 2022. Um, which is a uh, look back at 40-plus um, years of, of artists uh, exhibiting here at Woodland Pattern, and there are a number of related events. Um, so I won't go through the whole list now, but you can find information out in the bookstore in our print newsletter or online at woodlandpattern.org. Um, and then I also just want to say that coming up uh, in January, which is pretty close, is our 29th annual Poetry Marathon and Benefit. Uh, it will be online once again this year, um, and I, uh, it'll be 24 hours as the past two years of pre-recorded readings, short films, musical performances, multimedia, uh, all kinds of amazing stuff, and uh, we hope that you might consider being uh, one of the presenting artists, um, or at least you know tuning in for sure, but um, if you want to join us, uh, there's more information about that also on our website, again, woodlandpattern.org. Um, or you can ask us if you're, you know, here uh, in person. Um, okay, that's enough announcements. Um, and now delighted to welcome Brenda to the mic. Thank you and welcome, Brenda. Thank you, Mike. And yes, everybody sign up for the marathon, read in the marathon, or come to the marathon, right? Donate to the people who are reading. It's such an important fundraiser. Um, so I'm so delighted today to be able to um, introduce two dear friends of mine who will be reading poetry for you. And I'm going to start with, we'll start with Angie and I'll introduce Angie and then when Angie's done, I'll come back for uh, introducing Carlos. Um, Angie Tudal Vasquez is a poet, writer, editor, publisher, and activist, a former Ruth Lilly Fellow she serves as the current Madison Poet Laureate and, her, and four years as Madison Poet Laureate because she was reelected to the post. And her books include My People Redux, published this year by Finishing Line Press, In Light Always Light, and The Force Your Face Carries, and there are others as well. In 2020, she co-edited with former Wisconsin Poet Laureate Margaret Rosga, the anthology Through This Door, which was released through Angie's Small Press Art Night Books. Angie's poems have also appeared in many literary magazines, websites, and anthologies. 
She received her MFA in poetry from the Institute of American Indian Arts in 2017, and in the summer of 2021, she became a Macondo Writers Workshop Fellow. Together with her husband, she also co-hosts WORT 89.90 FM show Madison Bookbeat, interviewing writers and their recent books. So she is a busy woman. Um, about her most recent collection, the poet Santi Frazier writes, my people redux is a masterful assemblage of image, lyric, and narrative that honors land and lineage. Through dazzling delineations of domesticity and class struggle, Trudel Vasquez contends with generational hardships immigrant families face in making a life in America. These poems are brimming with craft and compassion. Compassion and passion are two of the qualities that I especially admire about Angie's work, her cultural work and social engagement, as well as her poetry. Her poem, In the Discount Lot, so beautifully demonstrates this, as Angie remembers participating in the United Farm Workers' Lettuce Boycott as a child. In that poem, she writes, little brown girls with picket signs, rosy cheeks, big black eyes, legions of ghosts above, behind, angels wing over us, ancestor feathers beat in the invisible breeze. Um, just beautiful. So I'm so happy to invite Angie to the stage. I got my phone here only to time myself. Um, Brenda, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I wouldn't be here without your support or other women of color's support in this role. So I really appreciate that. And I met uh, Carl and Ann many years ago. And I come back to Within Pattern, and it feels like home. So thank you, Jenny and Laura, for continuing. And I am really thrilled to be here. So I'm going to read from My People Redux. And um, the cover is High Stand Park, which is a park near me where I do a lot of my editing and writing. I swing on the swings, um, but this is the prairie. And In Light, Always Light also has um, a picture of that park because nature is very important to me. So I'm gonna start with um, the opening poem. And Santi Frazier's like, when you start your collection, start small. Don't scare people. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I take that and this is called They Could Be Sisters Three girls with straight waist length black hair go round and round the circle They cycle, talk, sing locks whip in their wake sunlight highlights red handlebar streamers spinning on two wheels they split, jump curbs catch air to fly or flee or speed, perched high and free on a purple banana seat. This is where my power started flowing on a bike in the driver's seat. The three roll on grass when a voice echoes, shouting distance rules, close the drapes. I don't know if people know what shouting distance rules are. I find people don't. But when you could play outside and your mother could yell at you, that's shouting distance rules. <laughs> So that's how I, I lived my early life. And this is a, a poem called Kick the Can, which is something that we played as children. Trains rattle across Four Mile Creek, carry livestock to feed the hungry machine. Swimming in flooded cornfields, we crawl through DDT. Mulberries, purple stain, ooze through bare toes, starburst heels, mosquitoes buzz in our ears, feed on limbs, bite under shorts. Ticks land on our heads, cause night body inspections. Car, corn arms scratch our legs as we run through farmers' young rows play. Find the scarecrow, the hobo. We cut off kids' play, kick the can under earthshine, cry out in the soft blue dark. Sweet clover, dandelions, oak trunks know our names as we dangle from stripped limbs. Dive off at six feet. I am nine, the ringleader, the I know girl. We tell ghost stories, hunt for clues, peer into pains. Little ones stand on shoulders to see, report back. 
We trample earth past, search for caves, sunken farmhouses, old graves. Sometimes semis tip over and hooves clatter up our dead end street, earth crashing roar, nostril thunder, snorts steam. Cows and horses destined for meatpacking plants plot for freedom, pass under our window frames, their last chance hangs. Mothers run out of their kitchens, scooped, stunned toddlers from the middle of the stampede. Remark how often this happens, animals breaking semi-steel doors. Weingartner Road, where underground railroads ran and good Iowans hid refugees in root cellars, in between fake walls, civil wars, until the next train crossed the land. The creek, lowest fields, straight line from China, spine of tundra. Trains still rattle, carry oil, soybeans, and children stub their toes bloody all summer play, kick the can, barefoot on concrete, moisture riding their back, sweat beads the second they leave the shower. Reporters crack eggs on sidewalks, the white steam. That is kick the can, and it really did happen. Animals would break out, run down our street, and we're like, wow, how do they keep doing this? So that was part of my childhood. And we would swim in the cornfields when they would flood because we don't have, we didn't have lakes like you all do here. So I'm going to read a couple more from here. Um, I have a foot in urban and a foot in rural. This is called goose eggs. And so I did go to city schools, but I spent a lot of time in rural areas. And I have a lot of family who is also white, so this is my, one of my grandmas. Goose eggs. Fifteen siblings orphaned. Eldest, she absorbed the kids' kitchen laundry, baked bread, made stone fruit pies, lemon meringue, banana cream until she died. Thighs, a side saddle on her tricycle, paddling to the diner, she delivered artful peaks. Holidays, she doled out hot bread in the corner, hand-sliced, country-buttered. An Easter of hard-boiled goose eggs, we gnawed on them for weeks, two-handed. Christmas, over 50 of us in one room. Everyone got five dollars, a card signed, Love, Grandma Alice, though we were not blood. Boiled goose eggs are really good. And they're huge. So we would keep them in the house until my mom would throw them out because they stunk. But we did enjoy those. Yeah, And you've never seen a bigger boiled egg than a goose egg. So I'm going to read the title poem, My People Redux. And there's a line in here that says, my people forgot they rose from the earth. And this is not just for my people, but I think of it as all of us in Western culture, how divorced some of us are from where we came from, which is nature, and we're nature. So that's really what that line means. It's four parts. My people redux. One crossed rivers and high deserts before water lugs, water jugs littered parched lands. Rode motorbikes, carried comals, seeds, black and white photographs. Fought poor villagers on their homelands, went from high school to the front lines. Lessons on patriotism led to flag burning, joint slint, alcoholic stupors, streaking. A roll of the dice, heads I live, tails I leave. My people forgot they rose from the earth. Two, our great grandpa knew. He planted corn rows, praying while he weeded and walked between his crooked lines, singing to the clouds to come, lay their rain music down, drum a new rhythm, tap the green stalks to grow. He wove a footpath from the back door to the smallest plant, whispering its name, and fed his family with what he wrought from earth and aqua sky, what he coaxed between loam and hard copper hands. Three, his kind fingers twist off pears, peppers, slender green beans, husks of sweet corn, crab apples, and peaches, what the white-tailed deer did not nibble. Bees buzz in their hive, lured by the burnt man who croons at dawn, by his wife who brings him pan dulce and black cream in the morning in her pink house dress and potato sack apron. Leather patched by sun in scarecrow clothes, muscles cling to his bones, never young. Family, a heavy wool blanket covers his sins in the heat. Blessed with grandchildren, they run in his rows, bring him home books he cannot read. 
pages telling a history he corrects after cartoons each day. Four, great-grandchildren search for his buried grave, armed with spades and hoes so they know where they came from and can find their way back to the original place of green grace, mountain breath, stews cooked with seeds woven into a young girl's black braid sewn in the hem of her deer dress. That is my people redux. So I'm going to read a couple more. Check the time. So I'm going to read this poem that um, I read for MLAK, MLK, MLAK Day. Everybody is somebody's child. For the woman who swims on her back, baby floating on her breast, eyelashes facing the stars. For the girl who walks three miles for fresh water, gird atop of her head, bare feet on earth. For the mother who shields her child from board games and hot chocolate from falling cluster bombs, whose fingers read coins and saute, red peppers, onions, gifts bought at the open air market, who quarters tomatoes from the stand along the road, roasts sweet corn from the back of a pickup truck on a lost country highway from a woman folded in half. The widow who hiked for days, holding on with both hands too smaller than her own. Another one strapped on her back with a bottle, stopped at a border due to the wrong stamp and offices closed for the holiday. The strangers who found her crying on a side road. A couple who crossed the Rio Grande with her later when the moon shone, though they had papers. Toddler perched on the man's shoulders, fingertips dangling bags for precious lives, snacks, water for the journey. The grandmother who watches her granddaughter while their parents work outside the home, teaches them to share building blocks, how to read, walks them to the park to see the squirrels and ducks on the pound scatter at their joyful cries, short legs scrambling down the bank. The woman who rides the waves and prays the rickety boat will reach Lesbo shores and on the other side waits warm bread, lentil soup, tea with honey, coffee, a bed to sleep, people who will throw open their doors and let them in, let them in. That is everybody is somebody's child and there are two stanzas of the women who hiked for days and the strangers who found her. That is my grandmother's story. And when you love people, they end up in poems, as I'm sure some of you know. That's just the way it is. So I'm going to read a poem called uh, Blizzard because I know some of us have to drive long distances and some of us have had some very scary drives. Um, this is Blizzard and I was living in Madison and working in Milwaukee and going back and forth and uh, this came out of that. Blizzard, rolling blind, no white lines, no light, no streets, snow beneath my tires five inches deep, I cannot see, ice pelts me, where am I? My eyes search for a glimmer of green. Please let me be going straight, not crossing. Iowa ice storms, legends, tree limbs crack through roofs. My car spins into a ditch. The shame ride back with a stranger. Worst stretch, closest to home. I could be driving off-road, chasing death. Howling wind beats the gold car. Alone, I pray, Hail Mary, full of grace. A child again chanting, chasing ghosts from my bedroom or driving home with my parents on Christmas night in a storm. Ice roads, no sand trucks, no salt. My dad swerves, my mom grabs the wheel. We were crossing, me a kid in the back with my sisters. I cast the rosary over dashboard, bridge cover, my savior, highway splits ahead. Turn, steer, plow, metal, rubber against wet. Take the next exit, tires spin, slip, carry me to bed. So that is Blizzard, and I know we know these, I know these roads are scary sometimes. And uh, so I want to read just a couple others from not this collection, but um, I know the winds are 60 mile per hour occasionally today, yeah. so everyone be careful on the open road. Two hands, 10 and 10, 10 and 12. That's the way you got to go. So my, one of my favorite journals is the Yellow Medicine Review, and they um, publish emerging and um, other poets as well. And I'm in here, and I was working with Allison Adele Hedgecoke, and she said, how to write absence? Because my line says, you can't write absence. And she said, try it. So I did try it. And this poem is How to Write Absence. 
and it is for my husband, um, who is tired of poetry, because as the poet laureate's partner, <laughs> you go around a lot of places. And I know we have a couple here, we're both poets laureate, so you know. You, sometimes I give them a break. So this is How to Write Absence for Devon. A hollow cobalt vase, a bottle universe, dirges sung at your funeral, chiseled gravestone markers, one plate at supper, rugged wheelbarrow still, purple iris bloom short, violet carpets cry out for your footsteps, silent moth wings drink at night from the bird bath, take turns with the bees, fireflies, crickets sing, ants plow tunnels underneath, worms creep, turn dirt in their wake. Tonight we forget our worries. Spoons sleep sound, kick off blankets, tug sheets. Cold at night we lack insulation from the deep freeze. The earth hums, hello, goodbye, gracias, go to sleep. Agile light streams bend the glass. Gold orange dream halos circle the bamboo floor. You laid, new homeowner with fresh knees, broad back. We wax for years with bare toes, feet, padded slipper soles, pet dander. Filial dust fills the cracks. Now you stir, make coffee, feed the mew cats. I cry five minutes max, anticipate your absence. No smooth torso flesh smell at dawn. Write the scene where you come back. So I'm going to close with some ekphrastic poems. Let me check my time. I don't want to take up too much time. I think I'm OK. Yeah, I'm OK. So this is. Um, for the Patrick Marsh Wildlife Center. And there were poets that were asked to be part of land trusts. So if you know of a land you'd like to elevate, um, you can contact these folks. They can put it in the land trust. And then people write poems, and they end up in collections. And so um, these are three I wrote for them. And they're not very long. But um, between here and Madison, there are pyramids at Aztalon State Park. So that comes into the work. And if you've never been there, I encourage you to go. It is amazing. It's the ancestors of the Ho-Chunk from the Mississippi Mound Dwellers. And you can still see where they put rocks so that they could spear the fish as they would come down. So very wonderful place. The land speaks. The land speaks to me, calls from outside the car window. We pass valleys, hills, what glaciers made 10,000 years ago when people moved to the edges of newborn waters where ice chunks broke off, became cattle lakes. The sign says basins where ice lay, depressions frozen in time, melt, mark the earth, become altered landscapes, birth novel plants where fish feed and frogs sing, and mushrooms grow round white saucer hats that tip over in spring from the weight of their halo christening. Blue indigo buntings fly by the stars, chart moonlight migrations. While we humans sleep, our feathered friends leap, follow the call to move. Swans and geese congregate. See 16 pelicans preen, their necks dip to drink, undulate herding fish in the water. They dance in rhythm, circle the prey, fin species. Their beaks lead fish to a net made out of ripples, bubbles of gas and air, lethal concentric circles culling names unknown. Before telescopes, night watchers, moonshine parades, dinosaur return. History. Settlers plowed prairies, occupied others' homes, sacred places torn asunder for cash fields, farms, bank pockets, and fancy watches. No song, no thanks, no story. When farmers named old waters for themselves, the people displaced. Does the marsh remember the sound sung out centuries ago by those who fished on its first banks, fed from its lakes, swam and bathed on its shores? Now people gather, seed prairies, count trumpet swans, unfold land stories. All right, I'm just going to close with two more. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I would drive through 50 mile hour winds anytime to come to Woodland Pattern. I drove my car, not my car, my husband's car, because that's scary. The land speaks. Harvested fields sing with crane footsteps. The threshers, the turkeys, fan, plumage, scratch the ground. Frog songs ripple from the pond, say, I'm here, I'm here, how about you? 
Slog through mud, stickers, branches, and burrs, tag our clothes. We find a spot, relieve tired souls. Here no bird pays rent, they eat, swim, harvest the soil with tiny beaks. Robins, crows, red-winged blackbirds, seagulls peck, plow the ground, water, air. They fly fish, catch bugs mid-flight. There are footprints underwater here, where a creature stood at dusk or dawn. The earth keeps the mold, little hands and feet, some creatures who bent their necks to drink. A turkey vulture makes an appearance, a hawk rests on an oak branch, hunts barely visible against the tree trunk, camouflage its best friend. When glaciers peeled back their edges, little huts sprouted, circled emerging kettle lakes, pools of ice and retreat. This is my last poem, Water Memory Mosaic. I have a little niece who shows up in a lot of poems, and these, this is because I tape poems to my walls, so it's painter tape, so I can figure out the inner architecture. Water Memory Mosaic. Body of water, boundary waters lace the landscape. People moved up and down the mouse, found themselves among the reeds, the fish, wild rice. Mound dweller remains. Here, see rocks stacked, how they stood on boulder dams, speared our ancestors laying eggs, spiraling back to their birthplace. Celebrants smoke flesh at night, sing songs of praise, prayers answered, sustenance for the next season, fins forward the way home, history in bones. Our cuerpos remember, I tell her, liquid memory, DNA swims in our blood when we drink. She, beautiful child, blinks, believes me, stops running the sink. Precious, I say, humans over 70% agua, water is life, all the wet that ever was, here now for all, and we walk, enter the lake, splash and race this summer day when school is out. How vast are we in our veins? Thank you. Angie, thank you for bringing us back to the land like that. So beautiful, man. Gorgeous. Thank you. Um, Carlos. Carlos Cumpian. Oh, I have to, before I give you his bio, I have to just tell you a story. God, I don't even know how long I've known Carlos. What, did we meet in the 90s or was it the 80s? It was the, 90s. It was the early 90s. I actually did, I was doing my, my very first like featured reading was here at Woodland Pattern. The kind of reading that wasn't an open mic, right? Where I was actually on the calendar and it was such a big deal. And Carlos's friend Raul Nino um, from Chicago was the poet they brought in and then I was reading with Raul. And it was so, so exciting for me back then. Um, and after that, I, had, I read a poem that was on the flyer about the once president of Mexico, Lázaro Cárdenas, who actually was a distant relative of my grandfather. And I didn't know Carlos. I had never met him. And all of a sudden, I get a call a few days after that reading, just out of the blue, from Carlos, who had somehow found my phone number and said, were you really related to Lázaro Cárdenas? <laughs> and from then, that began, that began a long friendship. So um, thank you for that, Carlos. <laughs> um, Carlos is a Chicagoan, originally from Texas, and the author of Human Cicada, released this year from Prickly Pear Press, Coyote Sun, Latino Rainbow, Armadillo Charm, and 14 Abriles Poems. His work has also been included in more than 30 poetry anthologies, including the Norton Anthology Telling Stories. Kumpian was the publisher of March Abrazo Press for many years. He has taught creative writing and poetry at Columbia College Chicago, in the Chicago Public Schools, and through community arts organizations, including the National Museum of Mexican Art and Urban Gateways, and has also served as a writer in residence for the Illinois Arts Council. Writer Luis Rodriguez, who you probably know from Always Running, but has written many, many books, he says of Carlos's poetry that, quote, it's the tempo and tension of igniting words, breathing magic into the living roots and branches of Chicago and Chicano poetry. 
and of his most of Carlos's most recent collection, Wisconsin's own Denise Sweet writes, there is a distinct and engaging voice in human cicada, one rooted in mythic history and contemporary street sensibilities. Whether wanderlust or tri trickster traveler, Kumpian reveals a magnificent world, one populated by Mayan gods, Amish hippies, and Chicano city slickers. Irreverent, impassioned, balanced with joy, there's something, something deeply sacred going on in these poems." End quote. I love the command of voice in Carlos's poems. You always know when you're reading Cumpian, and also his knowledge, his deep knowledge of Mexican indigenous cosmologies and his wry and sometimes raucous humor. Um, Carlos, so glad to introduce you to Carlos. Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon. I thought we were going to read from Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Anne and Carl. I want to thank Peter and Michael, the tech staff, Brenda, and you beautiful audience for being here today. Angie, it's good that I got to hear you live. I mean, it's one thing to buy your book, but to hear the voice behind it gives me a deeper appreciation of your work. Okay, um, the first time I was here was to promote my book, Coyote Sun, and in fact, they have copies available because it was reprinted a few times. So they're, the first book from 1990 is still here, and there are books um, from the Tia Chucha Press Collection, and uh, now the Prickly Pear Press, The Human Cicada. I'm gonna tell you really quickly why it's called Human Cicada. Everybody has an opinion about cicadas, whether you know it or not. Sometimes you like them, sometimes you don't. Uh, I'm hearing impaired now because I have a very severe uh, tinnitus. It's really severe. It came partially from being exposed to lots of loud sounds for 25 years as an educator in the Chicago public school system with really raucous teenagers yelling all the time, you know? <laughs> you know. So between that and Chicago is a very loud place. Milwaukee seems so quiet compared to Chicago. Mm -hmm. Chicago's super loud, you know. Okay, so I lost some of my hearing. That said, forgive me if I sound like I'm shouting sometimes. <laughs> my wife says, why are you shouting? <laughs> I, I, yeah. Hey, I'm deaf. So um, what I'm going to do is um, read what I have here. My book is in three parts. The first part is called Travelers Without Maps. The second part is called Almost Invisible Talents. The third part is Heroics and Mystery Cults. So it's in three parts. You're going to get a couple of samples from each of those. I'm going to open with a bit of Mexican mythology. And of course, some people know Mexican mythology to some degree at this point. The Mexicans called the moon in their traditional language, Nahuatl, the moon was called Metzli, Metzli. And they didn't see a man in the moon. What did they see when they looked at the moon? They saw, they saw a tochli, which is the word rabbit. They saw the rabbit moon. That's what they saw up there. And there's a whole story about how the rabbit got to the moon, which I will skip. because it's a, okay. But it's about sacrifice and bravery and all of that. Now, I'm going to read that poem. I'm going to open with that, Metzli Tochli. And then I'm going to move into a poem um, about, uh, called Snowvember. Snowvember travels. And so, yes, it snows in November, does it not? Once in a blue moon. Metzli Tochli, sky neighbor, monthly hides, orbits, seeks and labors in fullness, crescent and shadows. Luna observes our home as it fluctuates from aqua turquoise blue, snow all white, yucca blossom yellow, caramel fungal brown to dusty wool red sands. Below gray slate mountain ranges and green rhizome lands. 
eyes rise off this stone spot here in the southern isthmus, while our planet's many millennium old companion also changes under gossamer clouds. A sheer scarf moves across her silvery surface, briefly revealing Luna's rabbit Deutschli crater tattoo that is seen in bright contrast. All right, so that's that. Now, I have done very little traveling. There are some people in this room who have probably seen so much of this planet, and I have been pretty much all about North America. I'm talking, the further south I've been is like Guadalajara, you know. Um, I lived on the Mexican-Texas border for my formative years. Um, traveling was very dangerous in some ways because the idea that you travel, you get stopped a lot, and people <laughs> asking you where you're going and you know, wh where you're headed when you're coming back. Uh, that's kind of that border experience. And so, you know, I've never been to Europe, and the closest I ever got was recently with my wife and I, we went to Iceland, which is where the tectonic plates of the North American plates and the Euro Euro-Asian plates kind of meet. And we actually went and saw the crack in the earth and wanted to jump in, but thought, it, thought different. <laughs> is it really deep? By the way, who's been to Iceland? Okay, yeah. <laughs> So let me, let me give you a warning. Uh, now, Carl would do well in Iceland because he's a big man. He's tall, okay? And if you're a tall guy, you do well. Because, but if you're like, you know, I mean, I'm not like really small, but, you know, I, there were some Filipinos on this trip, and there were some, some Malaysians on this trip, and Roberto would do well, see. But, but the men's, when you know the men's room, they have the, the urinal like way up here. <laughs> I'm, they're giants, I'm telling you. When anybody, I mean, guys, girls, if you're looking for big guys or girls, they're there in Iceland, that's it. All right. I'm not kidding. And also, let me just say this. While Wisconsin has a lot of um, green consciousness, you know, about recycling and so forth and all that, you go, to, you go to Iceland, and I just want to say, those of you who have some despair about how will we ever change the society, what would it ever look like, if you want to get a clue, go to Iceland. They are the cleanest, most incredible place, and they recycle everything. It's really amazing, okay? And they even grow bananas there in greenhouses. Ah! But this is, has nothing to do with that. <laughs> It's November travels 50 days before COVID-19. I was in a trance coming back. As the planes cone, as the planes cone, bottom tip burst through white tigers in dragon-shaped clouds that for five hours surrounded us. I wanted my feet on the Icelandic beach or in the blue lagoon again. Once on the ground, just above us, not one but two suns. Just a tongue in the sky made of rain and curiosity, formed over the shores of Coal Lake, Michigan. We traveled far and it offered me a chance to become a stoic meteorologist with what truth I saw in trance after you asked what was coming. I gestured with hands rolling over and over, confusion, everything upside down, I said. Eventually the thorns of missed opportunities will leave the soles of our feet, while the sun's golden pollen arrowhead will rise again at the edge of the inland sea, behind eyelids that blink on the brink after months of masks. So I saw COVID coming in a trance. I saw that, I saw that we were going to go through a period of um, kind of just chaos, just what was going to happen to our lives. Um, you can believe it or not. This next poem is part of the series uh, called Almost Invisible Talents. And, I, I, you know, I salute people in the Midwest because, you know, a lot of times we are, you know, writers, artists, talent, uh, musicians, so forth, and we're part of that thing called flyover country. You know, the coast, uh, the New Yorkers and the 
Californians and they, they look at us in the, you know, Wisconsin and, and Iowa and Chicago area or Mi Illinois or whatever and they go, who needs to stop there except at O'Hare just to refuel and get on, you know. But this guy lives down in San Antonio. He's a terrific artist. Um, his name is Cesar A. Martinez and um, the poem is called On the King's Road in San Antonio, Texas, where I'm from. So this poem is a, in honor of him. He's still alive, he's kicking, he's kicking it with his art. Humble householder, modern Tejano Toltec, welcomes us to his armadillo corrugated casa while he opens his guarded black clippings binder. It reveals a parade of rostros de los Chicanos muertos, of those posed in their favorite or final public photo. We ponder the once alive many ceased orbits. Notice how heat has oxidized white print to brown. He draws and paints as deliberate as science allows, forms prism, prisms from the heart crystal. Out of each human face, resurrection springs in new colors inside the artist's mind studio. A magician's mortuary without mourners, tears, or egocentric memories. Decades gone grins, sunglasses squint, sampaku eyes stare again, afloat on a tapestry of luxuriant magentas, green and umbers. Cesar's magic, a peyote kaleidoscope, snaps open. Towers of firecrackers sizzle in a torrent of canvas strokes. While listening to the silver chords of España's flamenco, which accompanies him as he strikes and strums one magnetic brush, flashing side to side, open, closed, como el torador's dance to free the bull of blindness with shafts of light. Artists in Chicago are many, uh, but the ones who get a lot of notoriety in the Mexican community are the muralists. And so uh, some of our muralists are doing stuff and I salute them in this poem uh, and the canvas guys too. So it's called, It Is Dream. We emerged from the dark char, oh, by the word, the word Toltec, I have to tell you this. When you hear this word Toltec, what it means is when the Aztecs got to the Valley of Mexico, they encountered what they called the Toltec people. And they were the people who were the master artisans, the master builders, the architects. They knew stuff. They were, they were like, you know, this is the Romans meeting the Greeks type of thing. You know, the Greeks knew stuff. They knew all kinds of art. So anyway, the Toltecs. And you're going to hear that word, so it just means people talented in their craft. It is dream. We emerge from the dark charcoal blanket of night. Our ancestors foraged for more than food. They generated the genius seed of all Toltecs. It is too big for hooks, spears, arrows, or nets. It is dream. You watch for its presence with hunter-gatherer eyes and heart. It climbs and descends, offering a compass to fertile gardens as we walk the land. Tiny hummingbird heads south. A lights on the breeze where Huichila Pochli directed the first Mexica to nectar savored in, cinnamon, in crimson beaks and ruby tongues. Come again to us in art, it is dream. You are the young guardians of grand designs, sons and daughters of the codex keepers, mound magicians and pyramid magicians and musicians. Sure-footed and agile as a spiderweb mathematician, within the spinning galaxy of delta paints, you dive unburdened into the healing fires to retrieve what is hidden inside the obsidian mirror. All right. All right, so I'm going to go over to um, our section, Heroics and Mystery Cults. Some of us are so old, we remember an America when there was very much the official apartheid of colored people drinking fountains, white only drinking fountains. Uh, I was a kid, I saw it, you know. I, it's hard for people to realize that that existed, right? Um, this is a quick poem, it's called 1963. It's, I was living in Texas at that time, but um, this is going on in the news. I'm, I'm 10 years old at the moment. 
Even the concrete lawn ornament black jockey rebelled and broke rank beneath the restaurant's big red Coca-Cola sign and joined up with the truck drivers, maids, janitors, and field hands, rudely being jostled and beaten by Birmingham's armed, uniformed white cops, barking orders along with two German shepherds in their trained frontline mercenary roles, tearing at one young man's good Sunday sweater over and over. All right. All right, so um, let me um, do... So um, in Chicago, we have um, seasonal gatherings uh, that have been conducted uh, at the shoreline for many, many years. We, we had these seasonal gatherings uh, for the solstice and the equinox. And we would greet the sun. Usually we'd be right there just before sunrise with a fire on the beach. And uh, we never had any problems. Until, some, we, until we moved our location where the people could, the, the, the wealthier shoreline people could see us from their condominiums or, and not that they, could, they couldn't see all the smoke. I mean, we're really far away. But uh, actually we had police come out just once in the 20 years we've been doing this. And, and the cops said, what are you all doing? And we said, um, we're having a prayer ceremony. Really? Come on, look. And they, they came down and looked at us. And they saw men, women, and children, old people, young people, it's all kinds, all, and then all, all colors, all people in the circle. All right, we'll give you two hours to break it up. <laughs> I said, all right, good. So, thank you. We'll be done. We'll be eating pancakes in two hours. <laughs> this is called Our Circle Song. Our Circle Song relies on full lung power Sung as beach and sand, as beach sand covers our feet. We lean the split logs into a small pyramid. Set it on fire, its trail of smoke rises to greet the coming sunlight. This is what we do when the winds bring in seasonal change to expand or contract our circle's participants. We draw closer, especially in below freezing temperatures. But on this dawn, Dozens join in for the autumnal equinox transformation. The gathered offer prayers for all who are slowly losing sight or engaged in the fight for clean water. Mini Wakoni, water is life. The wisdom of the angels, we offer praise and health and help for all relations. We salute newlyweds and old couples with three daughters or sons we, who also join us here at the shoreline. Some friends' footprints have faded but they are still remembered. Healers and wounded students and teachers have become singers who know the prairie songs, the wide open sky songs, welcoming new life songs. We are the remnants of the upheaval in Turtle Island's post-colonial indigenous affirmation. Our circle includes visitors from all four directions, Asia Minor, Major, Africa's Interior, U.S. Southern Carrizo, Central American Spanish speakers, Middle Eastern, Muslim, Irish, Catholics, Jewish, Canadian, Cree, Great Lakes, Ani Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, and curious dog-loving tourists from the suburbs stopping to just take a selfie. <laughs> We've got Mexican Nahuatl speakers who offer copal and embrace Arizona Yaquis. New Mexican Laguna Pueblo brother serves as the protector for the American Indian Center's Eagle Staff feathers as Choctaws handle the drums. Our circle hearts reside with brother David Tlatuelin. In the pre-dawn pre fog duties, he shapes the altar upon sand and gently places a sage bundles cleared from the shadows of the Black Hills. Out of the carved wooden box, the sacred chinupa is unwrapped from the deerskin bundle. Smooth redstone, willow stem free from blemish is slowly packed with ritual tobacco. David took this task to heart and pledged before the sacrificial tree Sunday, to remember Sundance teachings in honor of his teacher, Silo Black Crow, pipe carrier. Thank you. And um, so, yeah, it's, you know, having a ritual for people um, 
a lot of times it is the only time for you know it's it's a nice place to meet it's it doesn't cost anything it's there's no commercialism nothing sold um there's we don't eat or drink there it's just a place to sing some songs and greet each other and it's it's very kind of it's kind of like you know I had to explain to a a pastor I said that that's the indigenous church you know it's right on right outside and sometimes it'd be the cathedral of trees or it could be at a shoreline you know if you want to call it a church I don't know I'm going to end with um with a poem that um so you, you you all know some words I mean um some of you probably have, have heard a, a, a fair amount of uh, Anishinaabe Moan being in, in uh, this part of the world. Uh, and some of you have heard some Lakota. And uh, you're going to hear the word Mitakuye um, Oyasin. You know what that means? Who's heard that? Mitakuye Oyasin, we say Oyasin, is um, all my relations. So you're going to hear that. And uh, when you hear the word cola, it, don't think of that Coca-Cola you like. Cola is, also means friend in Lakota, and you'll hear that. And why do I know these words? I am not Lakota, but the person I just mentioned, Silo Black Crow, was Lakota. And at these gatherings, we sing in Lakota in respect for his teachings, and so we learn the songs in Lakota to sing them. This poem is called, With Only Smoke to Cover Me. Tobacco shag clings onto rough, dry lips as I moisten a hand-rolled cigarette with tongue tip resting, half naked, on the county's concrete floor, save for a, shoot of, save for a few sheets of rolling paper to cover me. From ankles to knees, I turn sandy across bound, shackled muscles that have carried me to this bony cell where there's nothing to do except smoke. I wait for my day before the judge's robes and rules and freeze at 48 degrees. It started before Christmas when guilt flushed through me, feeling fresh from the sweat lodge mind. That's when I was arrested when I returned that thick, bright, bright wool Pendleton blanket borrowed from the Anglo's fancy gift shop selling relics and dream catchers, <laughs> made, by the bo made by the bogus chief rolling dice in the casino tribe, <laughs> and the 19th century settler nostalgia museum. What was I thinking, Cola, mi amigo, that praying all my relations, oh, metacoyasin, would, would protect my flat nalgas until I was able to shamble clear out of town. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> Woo! Thank you again. Thank you so much, Carlos and Angie. It's been really a delight, and you were just a perfect pairing. Um, so thank you so much. Mike, is there any closing uh, information or closing? Books. Oh, that's right. I always say that. How could I forget that? Of course, when you're in the presence of amazing poets, you buy their <laughs> books, right? Um, lots of books to buy here. So yes, uh, and, and, let's, and anybody who wants to hang out and talk, we're here. Thanks. <laughs>